What's up guys, Mason the Brock Anderson here, and this is Criminal Minds Evolution Season 1, Episode 4, Pay-Per-View. So yes, I've changed my mind on what to call this series, because the more I thought about it, the more I realized this is technically, it still is marketed as Criminal Minds Evolution, even though on Paramount Plus it's listed as 16, IMDb it's listed as Season 16. When I watched the, the trailers, or the previews for Season 2, when I was watching NCIS, it was listed as criminal minds evolution so and i mean even in the little title sequence which i will admit it's something i didn't talk about in the first video i am disappointed you know that we we got rid of any sort of theme song there, there's like a little bit of one but it's it's just like a tiny little blurb of it it's not really anything noticeable <laughs> if i'm being honest and going from the original title sequence the the little -de -de -do -de 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 -do, like I, i'm missing that right now so I'm a little disappointed that they didn't maybe just do don't don't even do that again if you're trying to separate yourself from the main series, but at least do a version of that. You know, get, give me a little bit of that just so I can kind of get that ah this is that nostalgic feeling we're we're back in Criminal Minds. But anyways, outside of that, this episode pretty solid. We we get to see a little bit more of Elias and kind of his mindset at the beginning and then we don't see him again for the rest of the episode. And I find that very interesting because we, we have seen so much of him in the first three episodes that to go to an episode where he only shows up, we see him cleaning up his kill. And then I'm, I'm wondering if we're seeing his dad there is clearly a hallucination in his mind, but I'm wondering if that means he was raised by a serial killer possibly. <laughs> and if that's the case, is there going to be some connection maybe to the team that we haven't, like maybe somebody that the team has caught before? I don't know, but it's, it's got me curious. It's got me wanting to know more and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what all is going to be his motive and why he's doing this and how he got brought up seemingly in this. Cause who knows? I mean, they, they showed the one container if this container is supposed to go back and date back for a while, he seems like he might be maybe in his 40s. I don't think, I don't know, maybe he has been doing this for quite a while, but I almost wonder if that container belonged to his dad, maybe. And his dad is the one that trained him, you know, talking about all these rules and stuff. So I don't know, it's just some interesting theories have come to mind after seeing that opening scene that I want to know more now. And so it's it's almost like the the episode kind of baited me a little bit. Like they tossed out that bait on the hook and I just chomped onto it and it just keeps pulling me along like, nope, nope, we're not going to tell you yet. Nope. So yeah, very interesting stuff there. As far as the individual case for this episode, I kind of figured they might do this and I'm glad they did it a bit earlier because if they did this like episode seven or eight or something like that, I would have been a lot more frustrated, but having a case that is not connected to Sicarius and all of his network, it's just, it's a, a couple of unsubs that are doing their thing in a general area surrounding the kill kit. I, I kind of like that idea because it shows that there, there is some chance happenings. There is some coincidences where you are going to get your serial killers that are killing around the area where Sicarius might be operating. It kind of makes sense. And I'm, I'm glad that they did have one episode to show that not every single serial killer they're going after right now is connected to Sicarius. There are still occasionally ones that'll pop up that are going to be unrelated. But the connection to Sicarius in this episode comes through Tommy and what I guess they're trying to talk to him. At least I hope it's Tommy. I said that with such confidence, and now my brain's sitting there going, dude, you don't remember names very well. Are you sure it's Tommy? And now I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> but trying to get him to remember what happened to his sister and all of that, and seeing him have his conversations with Garcia as well after he got her involved by sending her the, the kill kit information, it was all pretty well done. You know, the guy playing him pretty solid in his performance so far, It's it shows that he is frustrated. He is clearly trying to push back a bit but when he realizes what his actions did to garcia and he realizes that the team is doing their best to help him as well he kind of lets his guard down a little bit and then that scene where he realizes he 
didn't even get a look at the guy who possibly killed his sister. And I'm almost kind of wondering if we're going to find out that Elias did not kill his sister. Because Lee, I guess it's kind of close, so maybe he was using an alias at the time. Possibly. But I'm almost wondering if the Allison that the one guy was bragging about killing. Or maybe it wasn't even Elias that was doing the bragging. Maybe this Lee guy was a part of the network and he's the one that killed Allison. But I don't know. It's, it's just a lot of unknowns in at this point. So I'm wondering if we're going to get confirmation on a lot of that, or maybe some of this will be left up as a mystery, maybe possibly setting up for a season two type of thing. I don't know. It's very, very much a, a question mark at the moment, but I kind of, I like how they handled it in this episode because that where the, the case they were working on did not connect to Sicarius. They still had that connection. They still were getting information. And that was a pretty good chunk of the episode was talking to him and getting him to remember what happened as far as the stuff with JJ and will, because I don't know, they were getting a lot of attention and I was worried that there was going to be kind of them growing apart. Maybe because I'll be perfectly honest. I, I'm, I'm obviously not going to name names or anything, but I did have a couple of people that I knew that before the shutdown and all of that, they were, they seemed like really good couples and they seemed like they really loved each other and blah, 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 all of that. And it almost did seem like the shutdown changed things. And maybe some of it was they weren't around each other as much. And so they managed to push, a sh push aside certain issues. Maybe the shutdown changed them or changed one of them a little bit. But it did feel like there were definitely a couple of couples that were together for quite a while. And then shutdown happens. And then suddenly I, I see that they're no longer together. And it was very confusing. And so I was worried, you know, whenever they showed JJ and Will having some issues, I was worried that that's what they were going for. But then they seemed to work through it and it seemed okay. Thinking, okay, cool. And now all of a sudden Will has cancer. <laughs> okay. It just, it feels like they, it, already what they did with Rossi, you know, taking away, I've, I've already forgotten her name. Because like I said, names are terrible. But taking away his ex-wife slash wife slash fiance I don't know but killing her off and now Will's got cancer it almost feels like they just they want people to be sad watching this they want people to be upset <laughs> so I I hope he pulls through I hope it's it's not cancer I'm I don't know it's just uh as soon as he said that I'm like come on criminal minds why you got to do this to me why can't you just let me be happy <laughs> and I will also say because there were a few more references. Obviously, they're still referencing the pandemic. Because again, it does tie into what Sicarius is doing and part of his MO more than likely. But some of the lines that they, they're starting to say, it is getting dangerously close to using that term that was thrown around for so long that I absolutely hated. And thankfully, we haven't heard in a while. But the whole, this is our new normal. It, when when Will's talking about open up opening up the restaurant, and JJ is like, with proper distancing, of course, he's like, oh yeah, of course, safety is, is absolutely important. And I'm just, I'm sitting here thinking about all of the places that I've gone into that have the six feet apart stickers that clearly should have been pulled up a while ago. But I'm sure a lot of these places thought, oh no, this is our new normal. So we're going to put these down so people always know nobody follows them anymore. <laughs> so it's just one of those things where... It's getting to a point where hindsight now, it's kind of getting funny how ridiculous everybody acted. But at the same time, there's also that reminder of, God, this was how things were. This, I mean, this is what they were trying to do was just make it so commonplace in our everyday life. And I'm just, God, I'm glad we didn't get to that point. I'm glad we're past that now. But man, it still can be a little frustrating whenever it's kind of thrown back in your face. So, but anyways, with all that being said, that's it for episode four. On to episode five. I'll see you there in a minute. And now episode five, Oedipus Rex. <laughs> Get it? So pretty solid. I, I will say it was a little bit more frustrating and not because of bad writing or anything. It's just, I mean, Bailey is written to be a frustrating character. And so this episode has a lot of him in it. <laughs> so of course, it's a very frustrating episode. But yeah, outside of that, though, I mean, pretty solid. You got the connection to the senator, 
her trying to protect her son. You got the political corruption being introduced in this. And we already kind of knew there was some corruption going on. Clearly, the way Bailey has been trying to hinder the team and all of that, there is a real feeling that there, there's something going on, you know, as far as like Bailey's political aspirations and why he is trying to take down the BAU. And they, they talked about that a little bit earlier. So to see a story like this pop up where now it's a senator that's trying to step in and of course Bailey's trying to decide between his own aspirations but also trying to take down the guy that murdered this girl that he was into it, you could see the real struggle between his personal life and his political life and how how ultimately for him it's the mindset is i want to succeed i want to succeed as a politician i want to succeed in my my career over I care about people. <laughs> so it's why, I mean, I think after what happened with the Senator and all of that, I think he sort of realized what an asshole he's been so far. So maybe he'll be a little bit better for the rest of the season, but it's one of those, he's still not my favorite. So it's going to take a lot for me to say that I'm actually okay with him <laughs> beyond this point. But yeah, I think, the the connection to Sicarius kind of came out of nowhere, honestly. It felt like it was going to be kind of another half-and-half half episode where one was focused in on kind of solving the issue that the BAU has been having with Bailey trying to constantly shut them down. This felt like that was the main focus. And the other side of it was going to be Garcia working with Tyler, not Tommy, about trying to break into Sicarius's network. So to find out that the son of the senator was actually connected to Sicarius was kind of surprising. And I like the fact they even brought up, because I had this thought whenever we found out he was connected, he's way too narcissistic to be considered to be a part of the Sicarius network. There's no way he would kill himself whenever he was about to be caught to preserve that. So I found it weird, and I'm glad they brought it up too, but finding out that it's more so Sicarius needed the money that he was going to bring in and that's why he was okay with that connection. And even then, you know, there was still a backup plan in place where he was going to help out if he got the 911 text. It kind of goes to show that, yes, he can't control everything. And some of that lack of control over some of these guys, it is leading to moments where they're going outside of the rules, which is linking them back to his network. But he still has enough fail safes in place that even if a couple people do step out of line, he's still ready to cover that up. So he's very clearly showing how in control he is in all of these different situations. So I think this was another good episode for that. And it's it's kind of funny because it comes at a time when he is needing to probably tap the pockets of this kid even more so because of losing his other job and the fact that you know the wife threw in the, the whole, we're sending our, da our daughter to private school now. Now he's probably thinking, well, I'm. this is a good time for the senator's son to reach out to me because now I can really try to squeeze him for some more for some more money to use. So, yeah, it is a little coincidental that all of this is happening right now, but I like how it ended up connecting. I like how they brought it all together, even though initially when you look at it, it doesn't make any sense. But the stuff between Garcia and Tyler, it's okay. You know, I don't, it's kind of hard for me to tell because I've seen so many shows and I've seen so many bad shows that there's a concern for me that Garcia and Tyler are maybe going to become a thing. I don't think so. I, I don't think Criminal Minds would do that, but I've just seen so many shows where they do stuff like this, where you got two people who are constantly bickering and arguing and all of that, and they seem like they don't like each other, and then they get together because it makes no sense and... That's what people want, right? To a couple constantly bickering and arguing, that's what they want to see, right? Like, that's that's a good couple, right? So there is that concern for me. And so that's why I'm not fully enjoying these scenes between the two of them. I liked how he made it up to him. And honestly, there is something funny about seeing this guy who is so... He is frustrated, you know? He's, he, what he was trying to do, he was trying to do on his own, and now he's kind of being forced to work with the FBI, which he does not want to do. 
And so there is that level of frustration that he's trying to work through. So that is funny seeing him and Garcia go back and forth and kind of, it's not the same level of, I think of Garcia and Alves, you know, how she kind of pokes at him consistently. It's not <clears throat> on that level. It's more so like, no, they don't like each other. And so they're constant back and forth of like just prodding each other. You know, she makes fun of him and then he makes fun of her. It's not out of a, a place of love like it is with Garcia and Alves. This feels like there's just this level of disdain that they both hold for each other. And that's kind of what makes it funny to me, especially coming from somebody like Garcia, who is very much a I love everybody type of person. <laughs> So to see her really dislike this guy and constantly just throw it in his face how much she dislikes him, that's why it worries me. Because clearly he wants to help her to help him. You know, this doesn't feel like he, at the end when he's giving her the kitten, it's not so much a, okay, we're we're okay now. It's more so a, I realize she is the best option we have to catch this guy that killed my sister. So I'm going to make nice. You know, I still don't necessarily like her, but I'm going to offer a peace offering because, you know, I need her right now. So maybe they will form a bit of a friendship. I just hope it doesn't turn into any sort of like romantic thing because I just don't see it at all. But the stuff with JJ and Will also gets a little bit more time. It seems like maybe it's not cancer. You know, they said it was just a thyroid issue. So I'm fingers crossed that that's the case. But of course, at the end here, we see with JJ and Luke possibly being injured or maybe killed i so this is one of the disadvantages whenever i do these reviews most of the time i'm doing reviews of seasons that happened previously and either you know future episode pictures or previews for future episodes can be a little bit spoilery i'm pretty sure that i've seen both jj and luke in previews for season two when i was watching ncis and the commercial come on for this I'm not entirely sure. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that I saw that. So granted, they could still be horribly injured, you know, going forward, but I'm fairly certain they both make it out. I will say there was a little bit of a, I don't know, kind of a stupid moment where, yes, when they first enter, I can see them looking around just to check everything. But as soon as the cell phone came on and it came on next to these gas canisters, my first mindset is get out of there. Like if I saw a cell phone turn on be, that was attached to gas canisters, my thought would be that's a bomb. We need to go now. <laughs> so the fact that it took them, what is that? Oh, it's a bomb. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It took way too long. I know some of it was for dramatic suspense, there still is kind of a level of may maybe for the dramatic suspense, you could slow it down a little bit, but they didn't slow down anything. It was real time. It took them probably 10 to 15 seconds to register phone gas canisters bomb. And I'm thinking, no, that should be like a two second phone. We're, we're out of here. We're gone. We're already headed to the exit. But anyways, I think that's about it for this episode though. So pretty good cliffhanger. Again, we'll we'll see where it goes. We'll see if I'm incorrect in my my thinking as far as who's still around for season two. I will also say because they made a big deal of Will telling her to call because he's always been worried about her, and I did like that little back and forth where you know she was <laughs> hitting him like, "Don't do this to me again." It's like, what are you talking about? You do it to me all the time because <laughs> you know the whole hiding the dangerous stuff that they do. So that phone call to Will at the end, that kind of made me feel like, okay, so she's about to be in some danger or something. But I will say I'm more concerned for Luke because he was the closer one between the two of them. So if any, if either of them are going to be more severely hurt or possibly killed, it would be Luke because he was the closer one to the bomb. So we'll see what happens. But that being said, on to the next episode. I'll see you there. And finally, episode six, True Conviction. So this one definitely had so, so much frustrating stuff. And unfortunately, it has everything to do with just, I mean, the personal lives of the team. And it's something, you know, I praised how they are giving more time dedicated to following the team in this, in this new series. 
which I do like. I do like the fact that we're getting to see them interact with their family more, interact with their loved ones more. I don't mind any of that. However, they did two things, which in my opinion were so stupid. One of them, I already said, if they decide to do it, it would be so dumb. And then right the next episode, they did it. Garcia and Tyler Green are now together. Again, I said Tyler Green as if that is actually, I'm pretty sure it's Green. I know Tyler now for sure. But yeah, names, names are not my strong suit. So if I shout out a name and it's wrong, just no, I'll probably find out who I'm actually talking about in the next episode. But anyways, no, I mean, it's, how, how many times do we have to see two people bickering, constantly arguing? They don't like each other. They hate each other. The, the vile that they spew at each other is just, you can just tell. They do not like each other. Oh, they're a couple now. Oh, isn't that cute how they didn't like each other at first? Now they do. Oh, my good. I'm so sick of this story. And again, it's something that... I would expect out of something on like the CW, you know, in the Arrowverse shows that I watch, I, I see that a lot there. But on Criminal Minds? Really? Even NCIS, you know, I would expect it a little bit more there, but they don't, if they do it, it's not going to be nearly as much. You know, it's going to be very rare that they have that type of relationship. But Criminal Minds, you know, that's, that's not what I would expect, I wouldn't expect them to do some stupid story like that. It feels so teen drama-ish, and I hate it. Absolutely hate it. Just that whole, as soon as she took him back to her place, that's, uh, I, I, I just got that feeling. I'm like, yep, they're, they're going this way with it, aren't they? They're going through with this story of, Oh no, that whole bickering thing, that was actually a little bit of a, maybe they're a little interested in each other. No, it wasn't. And if you really think that that type of bickering in real life leads to romance in real life, you're stupid. And you shouldn't be writing fiction. Because that's not true love. And uh, granted, you know, it's not like they're trying to claim this is true love or true romance or anything like that. This is still, you know, they just shared a kiss at the moment. But it still, it should not lead to a relationship because it's not going to be a healthy or good relationship. There's going to be probably a lot of bickering and arguing and disagreeing because they do not get along. <laughs> yes, they have a couple of similarities here and there. They both share traumas. That's not enough to build a relationship on, though. So I'm just not looking forward to seeing more of that. And then the stuff with Tara. I mean, I was already not a huge fan of her and Rebecca. Just because it, it kind of felt tacked on. It felt unnecessary. In some ways, it kind of felt like a, well, we need to have a, a homosexual relationship in the show. So Tara, I guess, she's she was single at the end of the show. She was, sure, married to a guy before, but that doesn't mean she can't love a woman now. It kind of felt like that. And then they did tie it in with this episode. You know, they had the one guy who sent himself to prison. There was a reason for it. She used it. To kind of get through to him a little bit and figure out his motive for why he was taking the blame for a crime he didn't commit. So I'm like, okay, cool. They did that. And then, you know, she and Rebecca got into a little bit of a tiff. But I'm like, okay, well, you know what? It's fine. And then Rebecca's like, no, we're done. Because my my career is now destroyed because I did the wrong thing and you made me <laughs> admit that I did the wrong thing to save an innocent man. And now my career's in the toilet, and so now I hate you for that, and we're done. Okay. <laughs> just, sure, let's just basically make Rebecca the worst person on the show. <laughs> like, even worse than Bailey in some ways. Because it's not like, first of all, the reason Tara kept you out of it is because they were not sure yet, and she did not want to throw suspicions onto your conviction that made your career if they didn't know for sure. You find out, you're pissed about it, okay, fine, but then at the end of it all, when it's all said and done, you have to take responsibility for making a mistake. That's what you did. You, did the, you made the wrong conviction. You got an innocent man put in prison. That's on you. You have to make up for that. And yet she's still, as Tara's telling her that that's what she's got to do, she stands up and storms out of the room without so much of a second word. I'm thinking, okay, so she's going to be a little pissant about it then, huh? And sure enough, oh, 
I'm under review. And you, you're the one. You didn't tell me what you needed from me. What? <laughs> what do you mean? How is any of this Tara's fault? Again, you're the one who made the mistake. So you have to be the one to accept responsibility for it. Just because Tara and her team are looking into it and find that you made the mistake, that doesn't mean it's their fault. You're the idiot who did it in the first place. So here, hold up a mirror. There's your problem. It, it's just so stupid. And again, it was a relationship I already was not a huge fan of. And then they go and do this with it. And they have like this super emotional music as if I'm supposed to care about. Did anybody care? You know, outside of the people, of course, that were like, ooh, Tara is with a woman. Outside of those people, did anybody really care about Tara and Rebecca? Because they were not, I mean, they were thrown together at the beginning of this season. And it just sort of came out of nowhere. Rebecca's not a character we knew from the original show. So you had to make me care about them. We got a couple of scenes of them in an earlier episode, and that was basically it. You know, it was Tara asking Rebecca to move in with her, and it was kind of out of nowhere. It was just, they've apparently been together for long enough to get to that point. So it's like, okay, so this is a little bit more serious than just they've been on a few dates. But that still doesn't make me care about the relationship. You have to show me why do they make a good couple. We've not really seen them being a couple. We've seen them in the office together, you know, handling cases and Rebecca getting information for Tara and that's kind of all we've seen of them being an actual couple so we haven't really seen well what are they like on dates why do they connect why are they together what what interests interests do they share we've not seen any of that and now Rebecca acts like a little baby <laughs> and dumps Tara because well she made a mistake and Tara pointed it out and now all of a sudden it's like oh don't you feel bad for Tara no I don't, because I don't care about this relationship. Uh, it's just very, very poor writing in both the Garcia and the Tara aspects. But what sucks about it is both of those stories are very frustrating. The story with Elias right now is getting really good. I mean, first of all, the team is kind of starting to close in. They're finally getting some more information about what he's been doing. But we're also seeing how he got to this point. You know, we're seeing his backstory a bit more. We're seeing... I think it's his uncle. I don't know if they're going to confirm that again for me because I'll admit, I think they said uncle at one point. He did say, obviously, that Elias's parents had died, but I'm not entirely sure if that confirmed. I mean, he did say that his parents died, and then he did say that it was his relative. So I want to say uncle, but I could be wrong about that. I can't remember if they confirmed that it was uncle or not. But, anyways, we get to see him growing up and we get to see what his again i'm hoping uncle <laughs> did to him when he was a kid and kind of how he forced him under his thumb and what it did to him going forward and what it's still doing to him now and all of it is very very interesting and it's setting up for a very good bad guy so i'm on board for this whole story right now i am loving what they're doing the build up for his character it's something that we've not really seen in Criminal Minds before, because most of the time, if you have a long-running villain, they get one or two episodes tops to really explain the backstory of why they became that way. And then if they extend past that, it's more so the team trying to track them down and trying to stop them. There's not really a, an expansion of what we know about them. This is the first case where we've been learning about him more and more slowly throughout the season with every episode. And with each one, it kind of deepens my curiosity about what he's doing and why he's doing it. So they've got a really good setup for villain here. And I can't wait to see how it all comes to a head. You know, how it gets to that point where the team finally figures out who he is and manages to track him down. We did also get confirmation as well about Tyler's sister. We did see that Allison was one of the bodies that they found in the, in the locker that blew up. And we also found out that apparently... Lee was the name that I guess his uncle was calling him. So I don't know if that means that was his birth name and they changed it to Elias at some point to maybe cover his identity. And who knows, maybe because at the end when he's watched his uncle die, he said something about, you know, this is how they'll tie you to me. But maybe if he changed his name and changed his identity, maybe they maybe that's why he's so confident that he won't be caught because he knows that there's no technical relation to them anymore because he's already changed his name and his identity and all that so i don't know it's 
kind of an interesting concept and I'm looking forward to seeing how that progresses and there still is a little bit of mystery surrounding it. We've gotten a lot of the answers, I feel, so we know most of the story with him, but there's still some finer details that they've left shrouded in mystery at the moment, and that's the part that I'm excited for. And then, of course, once the team do manage to track him down, how do they manage to catch him? Maybe there won't be enough proof and they have to find proof of it. But it feels like, I mean, he's got this other life with his family. It almost feels like he has this life solely for the purpose of no, this is my life. You can't prove that I am like that because I have this. So it almost feels like a a failsafe to him to have a backup plan of a normal life so that if people do start to catch on and if the feds do start to catch on, he has this to fall back on and to say, no, nope, you're wrong. So we'll see what happens with all of that. But yeah, I think on the whole of it, if this is the most frustrating these episodes get, I'll be fine with that because <laughs> yeah, it's just, if it were only Garcia's story or if it were only Tara's story, it would not have been so frustrating, but because both of them happened in one episode and they were both equally frustrating, unfortunately it just, it dragged this episode down as a whole for me. So, but that's just my thoughts. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. What were your thoughts on these three episodes? Let me know. We could talk about and discuss all that good stuff. Leave a like and subscribe to future criminal minds evolution reviews, and I'll see you guys at the next one. But until then, Hope you guys have a great day, and I'll talk to you all later. Peace out.